American Innovation Webinar Series and the Age of Flight. Now, I'm David Randall, your moderator, Director of Research for the National Association of Scholars, and I'm delighted to have three very distinguished guests to speak to us today on the Age of Flight. I am going to be doing them in the order I believe they will be speaking. So, Dr. Peter Jacob, um, part-time senior curator at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, who formerly served as the museum's chief curator and associate director for collections and curatorial affairs. Uh, very much a specialist on the Wright brothers and his uh, books include Visions of a Flying Machine, the Wright brothers and the process of invention. Our second guest is Dr. Richard Hallian, former curator of science and technology, at the National Air and Space Museum and Senior Advisor for Air and Space Issues, Directorate for Security, Counterintelligence and Special Programs Oversight at the Pentagon. Among his many books, Taking Flight, Inventing the Aerial Age from Antiquity Through the First World War. And thirdly, but not leastly, Dr. Leo Murphy, who spent over 30 years in naval aviation, uh, ending with a final assignment as Director of the Aviation Training School at NAS Pensacola. He's currently a professor of aeronautical science with Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and the author of uh, four books in aviation history, including uh, Flying Machines Over Pensacola, uh, Hagler Field, and most recently Lost in Heaven, the bi biography of a Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airman. Now, there will be mo far more of their books available put into the chat button below, ideally with links to Amazon. This will be Put in by my colleague in the next few minutes. Uh, when you see them, go immediately to Amazon, buy all of their books at once, um, multiple times for your friends and family as well. I mentioned the chat button. Uh, the, we are going to be having 12 to 14 minute or so presentations, conversational. Uh, in first, uh, Professor Jacob and their Dr. Jacob, um, then uh, Dr. Halley, and then Dr. Murphy. When that's done, there will be the question and answer, uh, which will be done by you, the audience, ideally. You will put in your questions into the chat or the Q&A buttons at the bottom. I'll be delighted to pass them on to the professors, and they can also you know, look down, talk to one another, generally get a good conversation going you know, through to about 3.30 or so. Do not worry if your questions don't get answered email me, randall at nas.org, r-a-n-d-a-l-l at nas.org. I'll be delighted to forward your questions to the participants so they can have the option of responding directly to you. Also, don't worry if you have to leave halfway through. This is being recorded on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel, where it will be posted within 24 hours. Now that's, I think, all the housekeeping stuff at the beginning. So I'm delighted to ask uh, Dr. Jacob, would you be so kind as to speak first? Certainly. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, happy to talk about the Wright brothers, a subject I'm uh, thinking about and writing about. And uh, one of the things that always strikes me about the Wright brothers is that they have enormous name recognition, I think. You know, if you ask anybody in this audience, I'm sure, uh, who are the Wright brothers? People say, oh, well, they were the inventors of the airplane. But as well known as their names are and, and the singular accomplishment that they achieved, uh, the full extent of what they achieved and what they accomplished and what its impact is much less well known or, or understood. Uh, so uh, I'd like to share just a few thoughts about, um, about that to probably put a little more meat on the bones of Wilbur and Orville and also to kind of talk about uh, uh, the significance of, of their legacy a bit. Uh, Wilbur and Orwell, right, were uh, born into and grew up in the uh, late 19th century of the American Midwest. Uh, their primary home was uh, Dayton, Ohio. Um, and uh, this, of course, was the period of American industrialization. And after, after the American Civil War, uh, they were very much um, in with developing technologies and, and uh, sort of the, the, the world that was really rushing toward the, the 20th century. Uh, the first um, 
uh, technical endeavor actually was printing. Uh, the younger brother, Orville, was particularly interested in, in printing technology and started a small business to print uh, posters and flyers and pamphlets and those sorts of things. And uh, fairly quickly, the older brother, uh, Wilbur, joined him in that endeavor. And uh, this was uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the 18, late 1880s. And by 1892, they uh, began their much better known uh, pre-aeronautical business, and that is bicycles. They opened a, a small rental and repair shop in 1892. And by 1895, 1896, they were actually manufacturing their own line of bicycles. And this was uh, a period uh, known as the bicycle craze, where uh, bicycles were the first mass produced technologies in the United States and a uh, very, very popular um, activity, a lot of social implications for mobility and, and all sorts of things. So that's a whole other section uh, lecture about bicycles. But the Wrights were very much involved with that. So when they began their aeronautical work, they were very much um, embedded in this uh, rapidly industrializing America, uh, very technologically focused um, um, region of the country, and uh, were very much kind of primed uh, to do the work that they did. Um, and also, uh, I would have to say that timing was a big factor in the Wrights' achievement with flight. Uh, had they come along a decade or two earlier, uh, it's not at all certain that they would have accomplished what they did. Uh, or had they come along a bit later, um, it's likely that uh, others probably would have developed this technology in one, one form or another uh, story. Uh, of course, in our short uh, uh, chat today, uh, don't have the uh, opportunity to detail in depth um, how the Wright brothers invented the airplane and what they did. But um, what's important is to, uh, understanding a few of the more major takeaways of their accomplishment. Um, yes, the, the main thing that, of course, we all know is that in uh, December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers made the first uh, historic flights at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, in a heavier than air powered control flying machine, the world's first airplane. And um, I'm sure most everyone has seen the famous photograph. We uh, have a, a unique case here where the moment of invention was captured on film, that famous uh, first flight photograph where you see the right flyer uh, taking off for the first time. Uh, so, of course, that's the, the, the singular achievement uh, that the Wright brothers uh, did. Uh, but that's not really why the airplane is so important and the Wright brothers story is so important. What's really important to understand about the Wright brothers is that they built an airplane. They designed an airplane that could lead to what we have today. In other words, the basic principles of every airplane that flew after the Wright brothers and still flies today embodies is embodied in the Wright Flyer. The basic uh, design features with the regard to aerodynamics, their control, in the case of uh, uh, propeller-driven airplanes, their propulsion system. Uh, every airplane today and every airplane that's flown successfully is essentially a modified Wright Flyer. So, they had a powerful influence and they really built an object that truly was a seminal object in, in a very literal sense of the term. The other thing that's critical to understand about the Wright brothers is that they pioneered aeronautical engineering, the practice of aeronautical engineering as we still practice it today. Uh, I often say that if Wilbur and Orville Wright walked into a modern aeronautical engineering laboratory, they would not be baffled by what they see. Certainly there are many, uh, uh, many things that would be uh, unfamiliar to them. Uh, there are of course many more complex elements to aircraft design than, than they had to encounter. Uh, but the basic way that they pioneered designing an airplane, particularly with the use of a wind tunnel, uh, remains the same today. And they would not be completely baffled by what they saw. Uh, so we have to credit the Wright brothers not only for creating an airplane that successfully flew, but also creating the practice or the approach to designing airplanes which we still use today. Another often overlooked thing about what the Wright brothers did was their pioneering of flight testing. I think today, if you uh, uh, looked at the design of an aircraft or a spacecraft, um, you know, flight testing, of course, is a, of course, you would have to do that to, to determine what uh, was happening with the aircraft and uh, uh, providing uh, information to feed back into the design. But that was not at all an obvious thing at the, during the time of the Wright brothers. Uh, so their approach of developing a single continually evolving design using flight testing to uh, incorporate design improvements uh, was another thing that they pioneered. And 
also the simple fact that they needed to learn how to fly. Uh, you know, if you're uh, developing, say, another kind of vehicle, an automobile or a ship or something like that, uh, you're not going to get in trouble uh, if you don't really know how to operate it. Uh, but with an airplane, you know, once you're in the air, you have to know how to fly it. So the Wright brothers' uh, process of uh, flight testing their craft was also um, a means of teaching themselves how to fly because they understood that the pilot was also a component in this system that we call, call an airplane. So those are the, some of the, the major takeaways and the things that we really need to understand about the Wright brothers and why they're so important and why their story still resonates with us today. So how did they do it? How did they actually invent the airplane? How did these seemingly ordinary bicycle makers uh, create a technology that had eluded others for centuries? Well, the basic story really has to uh, be centered in the fact that they were consummate engineers. They really approached this problem as true engineers. Uh, many of their uh, contemporary and predecessor experimenters kind of looked at one aspect of, of flight, tried to develop other components, but the Wrights really were the first to understand that airplane is not just one invention, but it's many inventions, all of which work in concert to achieve successful flight. It was really a technological system. They didn't use that term, of course, uh, but in the modern sense, that's what an airplane is. It's a technological system, and the Wrights understood that, and they approached their design of it in that way. They broke down the, uh, uh, the, the challenge in its uh, uh, critical elements. In the case of the airplane, in terms of uh, developing a set of lifting surfaces, a, a set of wings, uh, they had to develop a viable control system, a propulsion system, a, a lightweight, efficient structures. And all of these elements had to be solved and incorporated into a, a single design that would uh, be successful. Uh, the rights um, initially began with uh, uh, an emphasis on control. Uh, they had done a literature search and, and understood what others had done before them. And there had been some work on propulsion and there had been uh, some attempts at uh, uh, glider flight, even heavier than air powered flight prior to the Wright brothers. Uh, but little effort had been uh, focused on control and they focused on that initially. And one of the critical ideas that the Wright brothers put forward in their control system was an understanding that the control system had to be aerodynamic based. In other words, the control system had to be one that was independent of the size of the airplane. The Wrights weren't interested in simply getting an airplane off the ground to be credited with having made the first flight. They really wanted to create a machine of practical utility as they characterized it, and one that could evolve into a machine that could carry not only the weight of the engine and the pilot, but a payload and other, um, other uh, capabilities. And their control system, both in uh, pitch control, climb and descent, and lateral control, roll control, uh, emphasized this uh, idea of creating something that was independent of the size of the aircraft. Uh, most famously, and uh, the center, uh, center of their later patent for the airplane was their uh, idea of wing warping, uh, which was their method of lateral control. Today on a modern airplane, we have movable surfaces called ailerons that move on the wings. You've probably seen those on an aircraft if you're in uh, seeing a flying in a commercial airliner. But what the Wright brothers did was to actually twist or warp the entire wing structure to achieve that uh, effect. And they did that to uh, make their uh, aircraft uh, uh, structural, structurally light, uh, yet strong. Uh, and also it was uh, uh, much better um, aerodynamically at the very low air speeds that they, the Wright brothers were flying at. So this um, uh, ability to control the airplane independent of the size was a critical critical breakthrough. Uh, one of the other uh, uh, principal um, elements of the Wright brothers' success was their ability to go with great facility between the abstract and the concrete. They were able to conceptualize a problem in the abstract and very uh, adeptly uh, move to a concrete uh, technological solution that actually worked uh, to solve, solve the problem. And you see this through uh, many, many elements of the airplane. Perhaps the most striking example of that is their development of the aerial propeller. When they were uh, moving from their initial um, uh, experimental gliders, which they used to uh, uh, design the, the control system and the aerodynamics of the aircraft and moved to their first powered airplane, they had to come up with a propulsion system. And, a, and that's the case, a system, both an engine and a propeller. 
And their incredibly elegant design for the propeller uh, really illustrates what I was talking about in terms of their ability to go from the abstract to the concrete. They conceptualized the propeller as simply a rotary wing. They reasoned if you had a wing going through the air horizontally, generating a vertical lift force, if you turn that wing on its side and spun it to generate the flow of air around it, you would then get that same force, but now it would be oriented horizontally or in thrust. And it was that very elegant uh, concept that led them to the first aerial propeller and uh, one of the most efficient uh, designs uh, uh, it, that allowed the airplane to be so successful. So it was this um, ability of engineering the problem, thinking through the, the concrete elements, and uh, with this very uh, uh, great ability to move from abstract ideas and concepts to concrete working technology that allowed the Wright brothers to really uh, create the world's first successful airplane. Uh, again, they fly for the first time in 1903, uh, but to them, that really was more of a proof of concept machine. They really hadn't uh, achieved that machine of practical utility, as they called it. And in 1904, 1905, they refined their design. And by 1905, they very much had this practical airplane, an airplane that could stay in the air as long as the fuel supply lasted under the full control of the pilot. It was a true airplane. Interestingly, they stopped flying entirely at that point for two and a half years. And they did so because they wanted to get in place their patent on the airplane, as well as um, uh, develop contracts for the sale of the airplane. But it wasn't so much that they were driven by a uh, profit, uh, profit motive. They really understood that they had done something quite revolutionary and they really wanted to have the credit for that. And they didn't want to reveal what they had done until they had those patent protections and contracts in place. Finally, by 1908, they are ready to publicly demonstrate their airplane. Uh, they do so both in Europe and the United States, and immediately the world re recognizes uh, the enormity of their achievement. I often say that the Wright brothers are probably the first uh, modern celebrities in the sense that we think about celebrity today, where somebody does something, they're immediately famous overnight, everybody wants a piece of them, that sort of thing. And that's what happened to the Wright brothers. They really became world figures almost overnight when they publicly demonstrated their airplane in 1908 and again in 1909. Uh, also, they uh, created the world's first military airplane in 1909. Uh, at after completing a series of trials uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. at uh, Fort Myer, uh, the Army uh, purchased uh, their airplane, and uh, that became the world's first military airplane, which, along with the 1903 flyer, is also displayed in the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. So the Wrights really uh, not only uh, created this technology, launched this technology, created um, uh, a, a practice to uh, uh, develop the technology further, uh, but really uh, uh, had created a technology that uh, in many ways has helped shape the modern world. Uh, I uh, have a favorite quote. When the Wright Brothers airplane was uh, uh, donated to the Smithsonian and installed in 1948, it had been on public uh, display on loan from Orville Wright to the Science Museum in London. When it was returned to the United States and put on display, the British ambassador was in, in attendance and he said, it's a little bit as if we had before us the original wheel. And I think that's an incredibly uh, telling way to describe the significance of the Wright Flyer. So much of uh, our modern world really stems from that one singular achievement. And the Wrights um, very much uh, uh, should be credited with having done that. So I think I've uh, exhausted my 12 to 14 minutes. And I hope that gives you a little bit more uh, of a uh, understanding of the, not only the importance, but the legacy of the Wright's achievement. Thank you so much, wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Hallian, uh, Dr. Hallian, would you uh, be so kind as to go next? Thank you so much, David. And uh, following uh, Peter's excellent presentation is daunting to say the least. I thought he uh, set forth the story of the Wright's in exquisite detail and, and uh, very understandably. What I'm fascinated by uh, with the rights is what happens not only in the process of invention that Peter captured so well, but that uh, afterwards we see this explosion that you, you see uh, typical of other technologies later. Think of the computer revolution, things of that sort. Uh, in the First World War, for example, 1914 to 1918, there were over 200,000 airplanes built and there were over 250,000 uh, aircraft engines manufactured in that time period. Uh, what's 
disturbing is that in his final report of American involvement in the First World War, uh, General John Pershing, who was commander, of course, of the Allied Expeditionary Force, the American Expeditionary Force that went to Europe, wrote, in aviation, we were entirely dependent upon our allies. And it shows how very quickly uh, a nation that develops a technology and pioneers that can really lose, uh, lose control of that. Uh, by 1909, uh, you had really had the, the end of the invention of flight. From that point on, it became a process of really continual refinement uh, and product improvement. And the Wrights, uh, as, as Peter said, in 1908, 1909, had absolutely electrified the aeronautical community, particularly in Europe, with their work. This is not to say that they introduced aviation to the Europeans. It was a very active uh, number of individuals and organizations in Europe at that time that were pursuing aviation in Russia as well, even in the Far East in those days. And when you uh, see this, and some of these organizations went back even into the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, when you see this, what the rights did was really act like a catalyst. And what happened very swiftly is that European aviators, particularly in France, uh, to a lesser degree in uh, England and Germany, picked up very quickly on what the rights had accomplished in terms of how they could apply it to their own design thinking, and then went rapidly beyond it by transforming and reinventing the airplane to a much more practical, uh, much more pilot friendly, and much more operationally capable design. So that in, in the First World War, within the opening weeks of that war, we saw the two major battles that basically drove the subsequent uh, evolution of the war, the Battle of Tannenberg in the East, the First Battle of the Marne in the West, decided largely on the basis of aerial reconnaissance inputs. Uh, the recovery of American aviation from its position behind Europe was uh, lengthy. It, it took basically from about 1912 all the way up to 1933. Uh, the European nations, of course, had basically uh, ruined their economies uh, with the, the war that they had fought. And so they did not have the wherewithal after the war to pursue aviation as forcefully as they might have done. We, on the other hand, had come through the First World War in uh, in uh, pretty fine fashion in terms of our economic strength, our industrial strength, uh, the uh, vitality and, and urgency and vibrancy of the society. And so uh, we were able to exploit some of the European work that proved to be of, of incredible value. And what do I mean by incredible value? Well, basically the scientific study of airfoil design, the, the cross-sectional shaping of wings. Uh, this was pioneered largely in France, which had been a country we had uh, used for emulation during our own work during the First World War, but we switched very quickly then to Germany because we saw that the, the German laboratory tradition founded by people, uh, most notably Ludwig Prantl, was really the way that we needed to go. And so in the early late teens and early 20s, we imported, uh, if you will, German aviation technology, both in the field of aerodynamics and in the field of structures and materials. And coupling that with American strengths in propulsion, uh, we set ourselves up then for the development eventually of the all metal streamlined airplane, which we were able to introduce into commercial service in 1933. 1933 is really a key year uh, in, in aeronautics. It comes with other years. You know, you think of 1903 with the rights, you think of uh, 1919 when we had three flights across the North Atlantic uh, in that year. And this is, this is by a technology that had not even existed, if you will, two uh, decades previously. But it also reflected that 1933 is really the miraculous year, if you will, of American aviation recovery, reflected to a very great degree the transformation of American aviation to get back on, uh, on form. And what was critical here was the foundation in 1915, the establishment of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which was the uh, direct 
uh, legislative administrative predecessor of NASA today, uh, the uh, Guggenheim Fund for the Promotion of Aeronautics, which between the years 1926 and 1930 established schools of aeronautical engineering all around the United States, either building on existing programs or in some cases starting programs from scratch, and then some legislative acts, particularly the Kelly Act of 1925, which encouraged the growth of commercial aviation, the Air Commerce Act of 1926, which established a pattern of federal regulation and licensing, and then the five-year Army and Navy plans of 1926, which put military aircraft acquisition on a regularized, standardized uh, process. So all this meant that by 1933, we had an industrial infrastructure, we had an educational infrastructure, we had a technological and laboratory rooted uh, process of research, development, test and evaluation, and we had the uh, administrative and financial infrastructure necessary to advance the aviation field. In 1933, I mentioned uh, that we saw the advent of the uh, high performance all metal transport. It was typified first by a Boeing airplane called the 247, but in more refined form and a more successful form later that year by Douglas with the DC-1, which formed the basis for what eventually emerged as the Douglas DC-3, the most notable propeller-driven uh, airliner of the uh, interwar and indeed through the Second World War time period. Uh, what's intriguing here is the role of government, uh, because while government supported the development of all these things, albeit tardily, uh, in 1933, when the Roosevelt administration came in with its mandate for change and its obsession with regulating industry, one of the first things they did was put into place a, a regulatory process over the airlines that basically threatened to destroy the American airline system. It resulted in the so-called airmail crisis of 1934, in which we had a number of Army aviators killed trying to do work that basically the airlines were already doing and, and much more efficiently. And the Roosevelt administration had to back away very, very quickly from that. By 1940, of course, we had a very robust aircraft industry. We were becoming already a production powerhouse that uh, would see our manufacturers during the Second World War up through 1945 uh, produce just shy of 300,000 airplanes in that war. But there were also still uh, things that, uh, that lagged. We were uh, not really pioneers in the gas turbine revolution, the jet engine revolution. When the jet engine first appeared in 1939, it was invented in Germany. Uh, Britain was second in 1941. It was only after exposure to British technology, which we then imported, that we got involved in the turbojet business in 1942. So uh, there, are, there are lessons here that need to, be, uh, uh, need to be borne in mind. The United States has been very successful as an inventor of aerospace technology and as a refiner of aerospace technology. But it has not necessarily been uh, a country that has an exemplary record in rapidly introducing and fielding it. We were behind in the introduction of jet fighters, behind in the introduction of jet airliners, behind in the introduction of jet bombers. Uh, we, of course, had the Sputnik crisis of 1957, even though American rocketeers could have very easily placed a satellite in orbit as early as 1954. We were a second to place a human uh, astronaut into space. Uh, we, of course, became a rapid second then and rapidly went beyond that. So we were the first to land on the moon in 1969. But taking a look where we are today, where we've come from, the successes and triumphs we've had all the way back to the rights, I think one lesson that comes through to me is you don't uh, only need to be uh, technologically perspicacious and innovative, uh, you need as well not to be complacent. Uh, complacency, I think, damaged the rights so that in the First World War, for example, you didn't have any right airplanes appearing in the war in Europe. But uh, in the years since, certainly uh, 
we have seen the complacency has caused us many, many problems. And I think we're facing that today with the challenges we see, particularly in our relationship with China. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask for the third of our um, uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Murphy. May I ask if you would go now? Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me say that I feel very lucky and uh, honored to be here today. Uh, lucky because I live in Florida and I've just had a second hurricane come over my house in about less than a month. And I feel honored uh, in that I'm on the same podium with Peter and Dick uh, because I cite both these gentlemen uh, in my class. Uh, Dick, you in particular, but in my classroom several times, uh, you didn't realize it because I was stealing videos off the History Channel of you oh. talking about uh, various things. Uh, I would like to start off by saying how wonderful it is to teach the Wright brothers. Uh, I know that many of you are teachers or professors and good teaching is theater. And the Wright brothers make that insanely easy. You're trying to keep your students engaged and I'm doing everything but wearing a clown costume and juggling uh, to keep them interested. But the Wright brothers, if you read about them in early uh, aviation, is like a Shakespearean tragedy. I mean, there's comic relief at the beginning of aviation with people jumping off towers with feathers on their arms. You have tragic heroes like Samuel Langley and uh, Wilbur Wright. You have the struggle between good and evil, which is the Wright brothers versus the people that are trying to infringe on their patent. And then you have internal and external conflicts as the Wright brothers try to first solve the problem of flight, and then they try and sell it from there. And of course, the last thing is supernatural because as everyone knows, all airplanes fly by uh, magic. Now, I am the only Naval officer uh, on this panel and I feel like too much attention is being given to the Army on this whole Wright brother development. Both Peter and uh, uh, Dick have mentioned the 1908 trials where the Wright brothers had to demonstrate to the Army that they could uh, get their airplane to work. When I was researching my book on the early history of naval aviation, I knew that there was a naval officer present, but I didn't quite understand what his role was at Fort Myer. Fast forward to just a few months ago, and I'm at a flea market by my house, and on the 25 cent table of this one person, I see this blue book with a officer's crest on it. And so I picked it up, and it was the biography of Lieutenant George Sweet who was the naval officer present. And so what I was able to do is gain a lot of insight into just what Sweet's role was. He was a battleship sailor that was assigned to Washington, DC, and he was a pioneer in radio development. And when he heard about the Wright brothers' trials, he was able to finagle his way onto the aeronautical board. While he was there during the 1908 trials, he talked to Orville Wright about possible hydro airplanes for the Navy. Well, coincidentally, just the year before, Orville had done some hydro uh, airplane experiments himself uh, near his home. And so that caught Orville's eye. And so what he offered Sweet was a flight in the airplane during the 1908 trials. And so Sweet shows up at the very last minute, Thomas Selfridge shows up and asked if he could replace him. So Selfridge replaced Sweet on that flight. And as you all know, that was the flight that crashed, and that was the first person to be killed in an airplane. The next year when the flights resumed, Orville uh, re-offered a flight for Sweet, and he tried twice to get Sweet airborne, and the airborne wouldn't, he wouldn't get airborne. And so Orville finally turned to him and he said, well, you're just too heavy for me to get airborne. And in his biography, Sweet says, the press just had a field day with us. And the major headline is, the Navy's just too fat to fly. And so that concludes his, uh, his results. Later on, he does get to fly, coincidentally with Frank Lamb, who was the very first Army officer to fly. And so the first Army officer flies the first Naval officer. And I don't know if anyone remembers that 1947 movie, uh, Wings of Eagles, but in that one, a uh, Naval officer takes an Army officer uh, to fly. I know one thing of our one of our questions today is how did the Wright brothers' flight lay the groundwork for future change? And both uh, Peter and Dick have, have said before is that it was an immediate impact in France. Uh, the France French aviators at that point had been flying, but they had no idea how to control an airplane. 
And so once they saw the Wright brothers' controls, then they wanted to emulate that from there. And in fact, uh, Santos Dumont makes the first flight in Europe in 1906. And so the Wright brothers, when they uh, are able to put in the public domain through their patent application, just how to control it, then the French actually exceed us, just like Dick said. And so the French recapture their aviation glory and take the lead on airplane development. And so in my course, when I'm teaching the parts of airplanes, I have to give a French lesson because when you look at aileron, carnade, fuselage, empennage, those are all French terms. They got the name it because of what they've uh, done. Uh, when you're doing research uh, on airplane history, it is always fun to find articles predicting what the future of the airplane will be, particularly since you know the answer and exactly how it turns out. Uh, one historian noted that the Wrights gave little thought to how their technology was going to be used until it came time to actually sell the airplane. And of course, the very first group that they approach is the military. But even then, the military applications were vague. They thought, okay, we'll use it for scouting and reconnaiss reconnaissance. They never thought that they would be able to lift any ordnance or fire a gun from an airplane from there. Orville himself is quoted as saying, that airplanes developed for military use are not necessarily well adapted for civilian use. Uh, the applications that they think is perhaps it might carry mail uh, to isolated areas. It might be able to carry light merchandise, maybe two or three passengers, but it's never gonna be able to uh, carry heavy freight. Orville himself said it's difficult to predict the future of the airplane. And this is going back to 1909 or 1913 celebrations of their first flight. And what he was amazed by is how fast the airplane developed. And this was confirmed by Thomas Edison, who in 1909 noted he had never seen an, an, an invention develop more rapidly. And he also said, I have good reason to believe that the flying machine will soon be succeeded by something infinitely better. And so that leads to the question is, when do we find out that there is in fact something better? Uh, when I was stationed at NAS Pensacola, I had an officer who worked for me that came from several generations of Alabama farmers. And one of his famous uh, favorite family stories involved his grandmother. Uh, he thought the event happened about the 1920s, but to make it a better story, we'll say it happened in 1910 when the Wright brothers actually were giving flight lessons in Montgomery. But the family story goes is his grandmother was working in a field entirely by herself. She had never seen an airplane. She, in fact, she had never even heard there were airplanes. When suddenly an airplane appeared out of the sky, probably had an engine failure and landed right near her. She said she was absolutely paralyzed with fear. And then the pilots climbed out of their aircraft and walked toward her wearing those huge flying goggles. She said, you know, she almost fainted. You know, for us, it would be the equivalent of a UFO landing in our driveway and the aliens saying, can I borrow your phone uh, from there? So I'm not sure what the moral of the story is, other than most of the world had never seen an airplane and it would be several generations before they did. So right now, there may be technology out there that we're not aware of. I mean, when you think of the Lockheed Skunk Works and the Boeing Phantom Works, you know, what are they working on? And of interest, uh, I found a 1950s article that was predicting what aviation would look like in the year 2000. And in my courses, what I call them is the four unfulfilled promises of flight. And I'm sure everybody can guess what's number one on the list. And that's where's my flying car? You know, the second thing is, where's my jetpack? They thought that all intercontinental travel would be supersonic. And at this point, would be doing space flights uh, to the moon. So in conclusion, I'd like to end with a joke that I heard that really illustrates how comfortable we have become with flight. And the joke goes, a flight attendant over, was overheard talking to a captain. And what the flight attendant said was, the people sitting on chairs in a metal tube going 500 miles through the air are complaining that the internet is too slow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, thank you all. 
Now, I'm going to encourage everyone to start putting in questions, many questions into the chat and the Q&A buttons. I'm going to start with, oh, I've got a first question. Tell me about the growth of mechanics. How did you start to get a, the growth of a body of people, not the engineers, but the people who could repair them? Is this something which happens very much in World War I? And is there a point where mechanics need to start having their own specialized education? Well, the, the, the sort of patron saint of aircraft mechanics is a fellow called Charlie Taylor, who worked for the Wright brothers. Uh, he was helping them in their bicycle shop. And he was the one who actually uh, did most of the fabrication of the engine for the 1903 Wright Flyer. Uh, the Wright brothers designed it, but Charlie um, did most of the machining and, and assembly. And uh, uh, so he's so, sort of considered the first uh, airplane mechanic. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, certainly by, uh, by the First World War, uh, you had uh, individuals whose task was to maintain the aircraft for, uh, uh, for the military. Um, but in terms of a, uh, you know, sort of credential, uh, it, it evolves even with, it, with uh, piloting, uh, you know, formal pilot's license, licenses don't uh, emerge until uh, the late 1920s, at least in the United States. Um, there were sort of informal ones, but uh, uh, it evolves. But uh, yeah, certainly by the, by the First World War, um, you had uh, identifiable mechanics, so to speak. And would either of the other professors want to speak to that? Uh, you're, you're muted, I should say. David, adding to that, uh, the, the interplay between the mechanic and the operator and the designer, I think, was closer then certainly than you have now. For example, many mechanics themselves also flew. And uh, when you had the First World War, which, of course, uh, the combatant nations produced hundreds of thousands of mechanics, as, as well as airmen, to support these large aircraft fleets they had, in the post-war time period, that was a tremendous uh, uh, nurturing body of people then to help uh, kickstart commercial aviation. And many of those people themselves as mechanics, when you take a look at their own subsequent history, they go through this uh, process of being a mechanic and then they get into design and they emerge as designers themselves of some note. And that, that's really kind of an international phenomenon. Uh, it builds largely, I think, also on what we saw with ballooning earlier. If you take a look at the balloon revolution and then uh, overhead imaging from balloons and uh, the role of the balloon in the military, uh, our own civil war being an example of that, but many other nations as well, you had uh, these balloon corps, which typically had operators. They had the observers, which were typically a military officer uh, from the uh, from the intelligence core of whatever army it was. But you also had a, a cadre of people to raise, lower the balloons, uh, sew fabric, you know, what, uh, make the gas, whatever it was. So that mechanic tradition. Uh, was a very long standing one, and I think it just evolved very naturally. Peter's point on regulation is an important one because uh, certainly in the United States until the Air Commerce Act, uh, the the whole uh, uh, notion of licensed pilots and mechanics was one that was, no pun intended, really up in the air. You had many states that really thought that they should be the focal point for legislative action controlling this. And so uh, there was a real battle over basically uh, who controlled access to the air over states and what was the role of each individual state in licensing the people's passing overhead through it that were flying these machines. And it, it sounds rather silly to us now, but it, it took quite a time to, uh, quite a period of time to sort that out. I think a lot more recognition now is finally being given to the Wright Brothers uh, mechanic. I know we've named uh, several awards after right. them. But it's, you know, it's, it's like if you've ever done a squadron tour, you know, you have the operations department and the maintenance department. So the pilots get all the glory, but they bring back a, bo a broken plane that the mechanics have to work all night to, to fix. So you know, they're always put to the side. And perhaps uh, Peter or Dick could talk about it, because my understanding was when the Wright brothers went to build their first uh, engine, it was a block of aluminum that uh, Charles was given and told to go forth and, and make an engine out of it. Is that, is that part of the story true? 
Well, the, the crane case was uh, cast from aluminum by a local foundry. In fact, the origin of the aluminum, which was, you know, cheap aluminum was not common at the time, was the predecessor firm of Alcoa. But what uh, Taylor did was uh, machine the crankshaft out of a block of steel. I think that's what you're referring to. Um, and then the other components. But, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what you were just referring to about the mechanics having to work all night, there's a famous uh, quote from uh, the First World War uh, where the mechanics uh, said, uh, the only reward for the mechanic was more work. And if they did their job well, the, the planes came back and they had more work to do. So um, uh, that, uh, that dynamic goes back to the earliest days. I, th I think when we look at the development of the airplane, uh, we look back on, on some of the legendary aircraft of the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s, and we think of them as relatively simple and uncomplicated. In point of fact, uh, they were very daunting to work with. Uh, you know, the contribution of the mechanics was absolutely critical to getting aircraft in the air and, and basically manufacturing sorties to look at in a military sense. Uh, sortie generation uh, with, uh, with uh, fighter aircraft, for example, in the uh, Second World War, if a Eighth Air Force mechanic uh, got a uh, 25 missions in a row uh, off without uh, his uh, 25 sorties in a row off without a sortie breaking for maintenance, he got a bronze star. And as engines became more reliable, uh, that, of course, went away. We certainly don't do anything like that in the present day. But it does reflect, uh, it does reflect the critical role of mechanics in the aviation process, I think. Thank you. I'm going to go from that to a, a question by Dave Cook. So how successful were the Wright's patents in the end? It sounds like they were rather circumvented by other technology developers, question mark. Well, um, it, it's a, a little bit of uh, um, a, n a number of things, but uh, the rights actually, um, uh, their patent was very broadly interpreted. In fact, they had the same uh, lawyer uh, who uh, did the Selden, the famous Selden automobile patent, which very much constrained automobile development in the early decades. Um, and the patent was so broadly interpreted that pretty much any airplane that flew infringed upon it. And again, the Wrights were not so much interested in, in making a lot of money, uh, but they really wanted the, the, the credit for what they had done. And they uh, filed patent infringement suits against a number of people um, in the United States, as well as in numerous countries in Europe. Um, by 1912, uh, Wilbur in particular was very involved with the litigation, uh, but he died suddenly at the age of 45. He contracted typhoid fever and he dies in the spring of 1912. Uh, that really kind of took the wind out of Orville sales. Um, Orville sells the, the right company. They had formed a company to manufacture airplanes in 1910 and uh, 19, not late 99 and began manufacturing in 1910. He sells out the company in 1915 and essentially retires from aviation. Uh, and in 1917, uh, when the United States enters the First World War, the government pooled all the patents as part of a, a, a war exigency uh, uh, issue. Uh, so the whole issue kind of just went away uh, because of these various uh, circumstances. And there's a, a been a debate over the years of whether or not the rights uh, pursuit of their patents really retarded aviation development, particularly in the United States. And I could say a lot about that, but uh, in my view, that's probably not the case. Um, but uh, uh, it really had more to do with um, uh, the First World War beginning uh, earlier in Europe and the expansion of the aeronautical industry and the aircraft industry, um, propulsion, the engine industry as well, uh, several years earlier than in the United States had a lot to do with um, uh, the European advance. David, on the patent issue, I think it's really a, a tragic story because I think in a, in a legal sense, in a patent sense, the rights were correct. Uh, however, I think they fail to realize something, and that is they fail to recognize that technology wins and secures its place, not in the courtroom, but in the marketplace. And they were very much wedded to a particular kind of design, a uh, basically neutrally stable uh, canard configuration vehicle requiring very active, constant pilot 
input and control. And with a complex propulsion system where you had chain drive to push a propellers. And the nature of aviation technology was changing very rapidly beyond that point. So while they're engaged in patent disputes and uh, many of the cases of which they actually won, and all this, the march of aviation toward the tractor biplane and tractor monoplane is going rapidly beyond them. So as a result, when you take a look from 1912 onwards, particularly after the death of Wilbur Wright, who I think I think of Orville more as the pilot guy, very good airman, extremely good airman, and Wilbur Wright is more the technological innovator and designer. With the death of Wilbur Wright, basically they lost their competitiveness and, and their chief rival in the United States was a man named Glenn Curtis, who had worked earlier with the Aerial Experiment Association up in Canada with Alexander Graham Bell, uh, people of that sort, Thomas Selfridge, and uh, McCurdy. And because of this, by 1914, the, the whole thrust of American aviation, certainly in, in military sales, is going toward purchasing Curtis aircraft. They're easier to fly, they're more reliable, they're safer, they're being produced in very large numbers. Uh, the, uh, the other problem is that if you take a look before 1914, we're seeing a shift in, in, uh, in American aviation in terms of people showing a preference to fly European aircraft. They're bringing in Blerios. They're bringing in, in some cases, other aircraft like Farman's. Curtis actually brought a British designer over to help him design the famous Curtis Jenny. So when you take a look at this, uh, you see that really the Wrights missed that moment. And I think actually the two years they took off when they were concentrating on, on uh, securing patents and trying to secure deals uh, might actually have been better uh, spent had they actually done a scan and seen what was out there on the horizon and how they could adapt, not only from building the first airplane, but come up with the successful second airplane, if you will. And I think they really, I think they really missed that. And that was, goes back to that problem of complacency because uh, Wilbur, was convinced in that time period that no other aviator in the world uh, had any advantages over them. He he thought we had a he thought they had a five year lead. And a point of fact, in you know by the late summer of 1909, you have a French aviator Louis Blériot who flies across the the uh, British uh, the uh, English Channel, and the the English go berserk because you know uh, they have suddenly seen that they're uh, their security behind this water barrier is suddenly a move, you know, and they, there's a big headline in one of their newspapers, England is no longer an island. I think one thing that, that it's not surprising that that's how it played out. I think if you look at a lot of major inventions, it's typically not the person who makes the breakthrough who then carries forward the development. Usually what happens is, you know, they, they kind of, done that and they're very much uh, interested in in uh, protecting their priority of invention that sort of thing and and then it takes other innovators who, to carry it forward so um i don't necessarily fault the rights for that i i think that's kind of the nature of things when it comes to invention and, and particularly large-scale technological development like aviation um but uh, uh clearly um their patent suits were were driven uh in, in some ways, and this is also common in, in, in the use of patents, is to protect not only your own patent, but to prevent others from carrying the, the invention forward to profit from it economically in, in ways that you have. And so uh, patents have a very complex motivation and, and use. Um, and uh, it's not just simply, you know, sort of documenting who, who created the, the invention. They, uh, uh, they have a whole complex context to themselves. And in the case of the rights, um, had Wilbur not died, um, perhaps the rights would have been the bigger players in the game, uh, but uh, I'm not so sure of that. Peter's point is very good. You know, if you take a look at the jet engine, Frank Whittle really uh, conceptualized the gas turbine engine as it ultimately emerged, uh, but uh, did not personally really profit or succeed uh, to that to any great degree, uh, even though even though he was uh, recognized as the inventor. You don't have a Whittle company, so to speak, making jet engines in the present day. 
And for that matter, Robert Goddard. Robert Goddard invents the liquid fuel rocket. In fact, just like, as Peter said in his presentation earlier, you can't really build an airplane without infringing on some area of, of, of the patents that the Wrights actually had on that, on that uh, concept of flight. Uh, in the case of building a rocket in the present day, you can't build a rocket without infringing one or more uh, Goddard patents, which were donated to the uh, to the United States after the Second World War. But Goddard himself did not really see the fruits of his labor. He had medical issues, but even if he had not had those medical issues, Goddard was not becoming a player industrially in in the future of astronautics in space. Professor Murphy, do you want to speak to this? So it's a, a remarkable timeline that few people discuss, and, and I hate to use the word flash in the pan, but when you look at the Wright brothers in 1903, that they're out of the business in 1915. You know, the Army stops flying uh, the Wright Flyers because of a lot of deaths. The Navy stops flying a lot of uh, Wright Flyers for the same reason, and they're gone. I think in a moment of exhaustion, uh, Wilbur once said, think of what we might have accomplished if I hadn't devoted so much energy to the patent lawsuit. And it did change their uh, public uh, perspective too, because then people saw them in court, you know, becoming very, uh, you know, lawsuits, that type of thing. And they had to reclaim, I think, their reputation, you know, which they've done. Thank you. I have a, I'm gonna come up with a different question if I may. How important is radio to this, you know, the airplane as a system, and how difficult is it to integrate radio into the airplane system? I'll, I'll take that on if I may. First, uh, we, we actually had we had experiments with radio telegraphy and aircraft even before the First World War, and it showed that it had uh, some e extreme. Uh, potential. If you think about instruments, instruments were first applied to aircraft to help the pilot fly the aircraft safely. But then very quickly, instruments are added that enable the pilot to conduct the flight or the mission to greater effectiveness. And in the case of radio, uh, we start to see the beginning of, of what we would call today an avionic architecture emerge. And I think the critical, the critical date to focus on here is if we take a look at September 24, 1929, when you have Jimmy Doolittle make the first blind flight under the auspices of the Guggenheim Fund that I mentioned, where he made a flight from takeoff through landing without any external references, relying on onboard instrumentation that gave him the ability to maintain wings level flight, to know whether he was nose up, nose down, banking, yawing, whatever. And at the same time was using radio navigation techniques to navigate to the point where he would begin his approach to land. And when we take a look at that, uh, that is applied very quickly thereafter to uh, what becomes the American Airways system, which was revolutionary for its time. It, it, it too started out uh, because of various experiments that have been made by the military services. But the American uh, airway system, which was fully in place by the end of the 1930s, really set the stage for the kind of a tremendous expansion we had of commercial aviation afterwards. The Navy used yeah, pigeons just spread when they started up. The you know distinction between radio communication and radio navigation and the and the, the use of radio right. for uh, uh, other other things other than uh, voice communication and so forth. The first air to ground uh, uh, radio communication was actually in 1911. We actually have that radio set in our in our museum. Uh, but uh, it's really not until uh, the 1920s where you have any, because of the, the, the weight and the complexity of the, of the equipment, that you have any you know, real regular use of, of uh, uh, radio voice communication. But um, it's, it's in the navigation area. I think in terms of your original question about how does it integrate into the system of the airplane, it's really more in terms of the, the radio navigation component that's so critical. Right. All right, Professor Murphy, were you about to say something there? I said the Navy avoided it and used pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> Every major naval air station had a pigeon loft. The only problem is they found out it didn't work at sea. So. 
Well, so, so you a number of you have mentioned the establishment of commercial, um, you know, airline services. What precisely is the market and how exactly are people able to establish a viable commercial airline system, you know, in America and abroad? What's necessary for that to happen? I think there's... I think there's a difference between the development of commercial airline systems in Europe and uh, commercial airline systems in America. Now, they come out of a common route, and the common route is by 1918, both in Europe and America, we're seeing the emergence of postal airmail, okay? Now, some of this is for government and military use, but in the case of the United States, it's also focused on, on commercial use. And then very quickly, much more quickly than in America, the European nations pick up on the value of using uh, aircraft as tools, basically as tools of empire. If you take a look at the French, if you take a look at the British, uh, if you take a look at the Germans who have lost the First World War, but they have formed a they have formed an, an uneasy partnership with the other great pariah of the time, namely the nascent Bolshevik state. You have this, this tremendous desire to develop linkages of communication. For the British, the major desire is to reach deep into Africa, reach then through uh, Egypt and the Middle East down into India, and then beyond that to link up to Australia. The Dutch have a very strong interest in doing the same thing, basically, to their Netherlands East Indies enterprises. The French, of course, have a lot of connections out through the the uh, Caribbean, and they want to, they, they seek that connection across the South Atlantic through their own African territories. And so it's really this imperial uh, rivalry that drives this. Now, in the United States, it's a different thing. We are a, a country that has a very large area. Uh, we have a high degree of prosperity. We have a good rail network. We have a good road network. But neither the rail network nor the road network are good enough given the distance of the country. And so the emphasis on American aviation is high capacity aircraft moving very rapidly, which drives the streamlined airplane. In the case of the Europeans, uh, uh, particularly the British, the emphasis is really on uh, imperial comfort. Uh, so that if you take a look at the design, there was uh, a mock contrast in aircraft design between the flying boats of Pan American, Juan Tripp's airline Pan American, and the flying boats of Imperial Airways. Imperial Airways flying boats, when, when Tripp and his people looked at them, they realized there was wasted space, there was high drag, there was very low capacity. It's because they were that kind of flying was intended for the people running the society. They didn't need to move to somebody else's schedule. They were moving largely on their own schedule. And, and by the end of the 1930s, we see that Imperial Airways is in a real crisis. In fact, it's completely reorganized. It starts buying American aircraft. And you know, you, you're off and running then with the American dominance of air transport, which exists up until the advent of the Airbus in the 1970s. Thank you. Do, I, do either of the other two of you wish to speak to this, uh, Professor just, Murphy? Uh, just one quick thing. When you look at the Wright brothers, uh, they could only carry one passenger. And so when you look at uh, going out into commercial aviation, you'd say, well, that's the end of it. But the very first airline, in fact, a lot of people say the very first heavier than air airline was Tampa to St. Petersburg that carried precisely one person. Mm. And so from there. And then at the end of World War I, which is hard for us to imagine, all the surplus planes could be bought by anyone. So uh, the there's a service that was done. Uh, Albert Witt at St. Petersburg's uh, airport is named after him. Just walked onto a Navy base, got one of the uh, flying boats and took it home. Same thing with the uh, Jennies coming out of uh, Georgia, where you could just walk on a base, pick a plane and, and fly it away and start your own service. Hmm. Anybody pick up a tank to do a taxi service or is that too much to hope for? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, I have a question from uh, Vyesna Radovich. Uh, why were parachutes not used sooner in World War I? Uh, very simply, the, because of the weight and the space they took up in the cockpit, uh, it was, uh, uh, they just weren't uh, practical. You start to see them um, late in the war, uh, but then there was also a component of, of the sort of pilot um, uh, 
you know, sort of bravado of not wanting to have the parachute and so forth. But uh, by and large, it was just uh, they were too bulky and, and heavy to uh, to be practical in the early cockpits. My understanding was the only people authorized to use parachutes were the poor observation pilots in the observation balloons. I guess they right. were shot down so much that they made an exception for those fellows. It, it was also the technology of the parachute. The te uh, parachute that was used in a balloon typically was a very large, complex, almost uh, multi-duffel bag type operation that you basically threw over the side of the basket and then followed. Uh, the the uh, kind of parachute that was a personnel parachute uh, was really first pioneered in Germany and was actually used operationally toward the end of the war. There were a number of German aviators, uh, some quite significant, Ernst Udet, for example, whose lives were saved by using them. There was a wonderful book uh, that the uh, listeners to this program might enjoy by a man named Arthur Lee, a World War I British fighter pilot who wrote a book called No Parachute, which talks basically about the perils of being a fighter pilot in the First World War and the, and the really harrowing constant fear they had of finding themselves in a burning aircraft without an ability to escape from it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very intriguing. Uh, there, was, there was also, Peter hit very well on what the, the uh, root causes of this were, but there was another one as well. There was a, a feeling among the general staffs that if you gave pilots parachutes, they might be tempted to leap out of their airplanes uh, rather than engage in combat, which is, when you think about it, totally insulting as well as, as utterly, utterly foolish. Hmm. Of course, Thank you. These were people that were, you know, prosecuting trench warfare and uh, yes. you know, so that that right. mindset, um, you know, is certainly understandable in the concept of, in the context wow. of First World War strategy. Not for nothing were they called donkeys, the donkeys, in uh, in uh, Arthur, uh, in uh, Alan Clark's memorable phrase. Yeah. So this would be pigeons led by donkeys, or eagles led by yes. donkeys. Yes. Yeah. Eagle. Eagles frustrated by donkeys. Yeah. I'm going to go to a question from Steve Conair. Did anyone develop a rudimentary wind tunnel before the Wright brothers? Yes, uh, actually, seventy-one. Yes. John Browning. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. there were there were as many as a dozen wind tunnels that were in use before the Wrights, but they were all very qualitative in nature. In other words, they would put something in the flow and see what it would do in a qualitative way. Why the Wright Brothers wind tunnel is so um, significant in the breakthrough tunnel is because it was the first tunnel used to actually design an airplane. In other words they were actually getting aerodynamic data that was directly used in the design of the airplane, specifically the coefficients of lift and drag for the wing shapes that they were testing. So, um, and that's what I was kind of getting at, uh, um, that being a central tool to their development of aerospace engineering as a practice, the use of the wind tunnel literally as a tool to design an airplane. So um, no, the Wright brothers didn't invent the wind tunnel. They didn't have the first one but they had the first one that really um, uh, was meaningful and every wind tunnel that uh, was used subsequently, like the airplane, is rooted in that right, that right tunnel, the instruments that were used inside the right tunnel. There were three great pioneers following the rights in wind tunnel design. Uh, the first was uh, Ludwig Prantl at the uh, Motor Luftschifffahrt Gesellschaft uh, in Germany, which became the basis of what was called the Aerodynamische Versuchsanstalt at Göttingen. And uh, he developed a closed flow tunnel that was very influential and really set the stage then for taking the, the uh, products of applied mathematics and airfoil analysis and then refining their design. Uh, Max Monk, one of his students, then took it a step further by emigrating to the United States, becoming chief of research for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics and inventing the pressurized wind tunnel. The pressurized wind tunnel was critically important because it enabled you to relate better the performance of a model in that tunnel to the full-sized aircraft. And then finally, Carl Wieselsberger, another Prontel student, probably the most prominent uh, wind tunnel designer of the early 20th century, uh, went beyond that and developed a series of very high speed tunnels culminating in the first practical supersonic wind tunnel 
that was used to refine German uh, missile and aircraft shapes in the Second World War. Thank you. Uh, anybody else on this? I'm going to go to a different question then, I'm inspired by something which was said earlier about needing to get all the state laws, you know, in order to um, have airplane flight. How about international law? What was needed in terms of international law to make, you know, you know international flights possible, it, convenient? We actually have in 1918 and 1919, uh, a, a, the beginning of international air regulation. And uh, we have the formation of what becomes the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. And we have a series of, of conferences and meetings throughout the 1920s. A lot of this related to landing rights. And when you were dealing with countries that were locked in global rivalries, that became, uh, that became a source of some concern. Another was the relationship of Germany to European aviation. How, how would one integrate Germany back into the European aviation construct? But uh, international air regulation was, was uh, a, a very thorny and difficult subject. Uh, for example, if you take a look at Juan Tripp and his relationship with the Brits, on flying across the North Atlantic, it was much easier for Tripp to actually uh, expand first across the Pacific in 1935 before getting to the point that in 1939 he was able to begin commercial air service to Britain. And a lot of this directly related on agreements that had to be reached by the Foreign Office in Britain, by the Canadian uh, foreign authorities, and then by uh, the United States State Department before that could happen. Now, of course, once World War II broke out, uh, you started to develop an Atlantic air bridge that by 1945, you were having 200 flights a week across the North Atlantic. And so this really kind of went away. But even then in 1947, you had the so-called Montreal Convention and you had a Chicago Convention at the same time that set the stage for the kind of routine international air transport management and organization that you, uh, you have in the present day. That's wonderfully comprehensive. Does anybody want to add to that? Well, one of the things I teach and just building on uh, Dick is, you know, the freedoms of the air, where you look at commercial passenger travel, just what are you allowed to do? You're allowed to bring someone from your country to another country. And then what someone never allows is called cabotage, where a foreign airline would be moving within your country. And so to this day, that has never been allowed in the United States. And Dr. Jacob? Uh, uh, I don't have anything further to really add. Uh, those are comprehensive answers. Right. Thank you. And in that case, um, another question. So it was mentioned about you know, needing to develop aeronautics engineering as a particular discipline. How much is the airplane pushing systems engineering? How much is it so much of a complex machine, a complex system that is pushing the development of systems engineering as well as a sub-discipline? Peter addressed very comprehensively in his presentation, the role of the rights as engineers. You know, they yeah. didn't have the degree after their name, but uh, yeah. anybody would be foolish to allege that they weren't functioning as engineers. They were thinking, yeah. thinking and functioning as engineers uh, in, in such a way that as, as Peter said, they would be completely at home today looking at the aeronautical design process. Oddly enough though, if you take a look at the development of aeronautical engineering, uh, we were very slow to pursue it in the United States. Uh, at the end of the First World War, if you take a look at the number of people that could be considered degreed, academically, scientifically trained aeronautical engineers, it was probably less than about a dozen people, in all honesty. The field then did expand. It, came, it, it grew largely out of the grafting of hydrodynamics, uh, fluid dynamics, basically, onto mechanical engineering. But that's where the Guggenheims were so critically important. The Guggenheim Fund from 1926 to 1930, in setting up these schools of aeronautical engineering, also arranged for the importation or the hiring of faculty. You have a number of notable people. In the United States, you have a naval officer named uh, Jerome Hunsaker at MIT, who later becomes a major figure in the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, who plays the leading role in this. You have another naval officer who 
uh, in the First World War had argued for this, and that was Captain uh, Washington Irving Chambers, another battleship officer, but a man who was very perceptive in taking a look at advanced technology. Uh, but really, uh, the big thing for America was the importation of Max Monk from Germany, and then shortly thereafter, uh, bringing on board Theodor von Karman. Uh, despite that name, uh, he's actually Hungarian uh, in background. He's, uh, he's a, a Jewish uh, physicist, a fluid dynamicist working in Aachen, Germany. Uh, he's not dumb. He sees which way Germany is going, and he's up for uh, plucking. And he uh, is hired from the Technische Hochschule in Aachen to come to Caltech and establish uh, the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology, which becomes the major American academic powerhouse of aeronautical research and development. So that by the time of the Second World War, we had a very large number of American trained engineers from places like the University of Washington, the University of Michigan, Georgia School of Technology, now Georgia Tech, of course, uh, Caltech, MIT, uh, New York University. These were all Guggenheim schools. You had an Airship Institute, the Guggenheim set up at Akron. And these people, of course, very quickly rose to the point that, if memory serves me right, on the eve of the Second World War, something like 70% of aircraft design firms in the United States had as their leading engineers graduates of Guggenheim schools. And of course, that continued not only during the war, but after the Second World War as well. You know, there's an old uh, saying that that there really is no such thing as aeronautical engineering. What it really is, is an amalgam of all these other disciplines, structural right. engineers, fluid, uh, fluid dynamics, um, and later to electrical engineering. Um, so aerospace engineering is really an amalgam of many, many um, engineering disciplines. So in re response to your original question is, you know, where do these, uh, how does aerospace engineering push other forms of engineering and, and, and systems development. In, in many ways, it's it's the bringing of these other uh, disciplines of, of engineering and systems development to aerospace. And, and that's what we kind of uh, define as aerospace engineering. But in many ways, um, it's an amalgam of a lot of disciplines. And it goes back to the question that you raised, David, about the systems airplane, you know, the airplane as a system. Uh, you know, at any point in time with the technology, you could see that the airplane was a system and that it was incorporating, it was uh, incorporating leading technological elements from various disciplines. But when you take a look at the, the grafting of the uh, avionic revolution onto the airplane, and then you see in the post Second World War era, the rapid rise of computational science and the grafting of computers and aircraft and the integration of that at the end of the 1970s with sensors and then uh, at the end of the 1960s with sensors and then in the 1970s with active computer controlled flight control and propulsion control architectures you're right on the verge of what we see today where you have a commercial airliner flying overhead it is communicating with its base of operations it's communicating with the airline's maintenance staff the air crew are in constant communication electronically uh, with with uh, higher entities you know the faa the air transport network whatever it is so that when that airplane lands and and of course uh uh docks so to speak Mechanics are already rolling out on something that they have detected in the flight they need to fix, uh, to fix tweet, uh, uh, tw you know, tweet with or whatever, you know, to get it back in the air. Uh, so we really are in the systems era. You see this by taking a look at air, uh, aviation museums. You know, you take a look at older aircraft, and if they peel off the side panels of them, you can look like th right through them. It's been a very long time since we've developed aircraft, you've, if you peel off the skin on one side that you can look through uh, and see the other side of the airplane. Uh, it, that actually ended just about 1946-1947. And uh, Professor Murphy, did you want to add to this? Uh, I thought for sure Dick was going to say when you looked at that airplane flying overhead, there's not a pilot in it. And yeah. I think when you look at uh, AI and the development of that yeah. is that's what they're going to from yeah, uh, exactly. Dual pilot to single pilot to no pilot at all. No pilot. I mean, they have systems right now where you can put a chip in someone and 
you could walk up, put it under the scanner and say, nope, you're too tired or you're slightly hypoxic. Uh, you're not going flying today or inside the plane. It's kind of like your car. I have a little warning where if I wobble too much, it, a little silent bump and say, need a break. Or it can maybe the same thing with single pilot aircraft saying, no, I'm taking over right now. You're too fatigued or hypoxic. I'm going to have a question now about airfields and airports. What's the history of developing them? What is the history of thinking we need to have a dedicated surface? When do you get planes that need to be able to land on you know, a hard surface? And what is the development of that as part of the general development of the age of flight? Well, I think from my standpoint, I'll just throw these out. Obviously, uh, Peter would uh, mention Huffman Prairie as a, as a functioning aerodrome, if you will. Uh, I would say that if you take a look in France, you have uh, uh, UVC outside uh, Paris, uh, which starts very early on as a, as a center of, of French flying. Uh, if you take a look in the United States, we think of College Park. You think of North Island uh, before the uh, First World War, which was... Uh, uh, of course, North Island is still with us. College Park is as well, for that matter. Uh, you have you have landing fields elsewhere in Europe that eventually evolve over time into major airports, Tempelhof, for example, places like that. So it, it develops very quickly. You know, people realize that you're dealing with a technology here where you need some sort of of level space where an airplane can land and roll out. And while uh, initially, airfields were largely just carefully tended uh, grass. Uh, very quickly, we start to see paving come in. You know, paving we start to see in, uh, certainly in the 1920s, uh, sometimes just with, uh, uh, with cinder type surfaces, but, but very quickly moving beyond that. Yeah, I mean, in this early period, you have, you know, so-called flying fields, you know, people are, are designating the area where aviation activity is happening. But I think your question maybe was, and correct me if I'm wrong, coming more toward, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about systems, sort of a, an airport system, an air transport system, where you have um, uh, uh, scheduled air routes that are going between established facilities, and those facilities need to be able to accommodate aircraft maintain them, um, uh, manage passenger flow, all of those sorts of things. That's, um, you know, beginning 1930s, uh, particularly with uh, the development of the, the modern airliners like the DC-3. Um, but I think that kind of complex airport um, system and integration is, is perhaps a, a post-Second World War phenomenon, much like the, you know, international, uh, the, the interstate highway system in the United States. I mean, it, it's, there are roads before that, but it's not until you really get the infrastructure where you have um, a system of, of uh, uh, roads and highways and so forth that allow for interstate tra transport. I think there's a parallel sort of thing with, with airports in the post-war period. In many ways, the advent of the flying boat, the development of the flying boat had been to address the problem that you had with too few airports for international flying. And there was the safety idea that the flying boat could come down in the open sea as well. But the advent of the long range uh, monoplane transport typified by the DC-4 of 1942 and some foreign aircraft that uh, their development was interrupted by the Second World War uh, resulted immediately in the end of the flying boat. You know, by 1945, by the end of 1945, the Atlantic on both sides uh, was ringed with airfields. This was pointed out by some uh, wonderful essays by uh, the late uh, Richard uh, Smith, a noted aviation historian. And uh, when you take a look at uh, when you take a look at that development, that that global development of airports in the in the literals, if you will. The flying boat was really dead from that point on. And uh, Professor it's interesting when you were looking uh, ahead, predicting the future of aviation in 1909, Orville expressed that same concern. He said commercial aviation will not develop until there's prepared landing fields that will allow someone to go, you know, transcontinental. Thank you. I have a question which is first for Professor Murphy, but possibly for the other two of you. What's it like to fly? Can you talk something about the challenges and the joys of flying? I think we ought to have that question in here if we're talking about the age of flight. 
This is going to seem like a strange answer, but I'm going to talk about the joy of riding. Uh, the New York Times in their uh, book review uh, every week says, where is your favorite place to read? And uh, when I volunteered to be a part of this, you know, I brought some book with me on an airline trip and I'm sitting there in a window by the airplane reading a book, you know, and sipping a Coke and going, it doesn't get any better than this. So it's, it seems kind of strange as a rider to say it's, uh, it's like that. But I think uh, from a flight perspective, when you first start flying, it's complete panic. I mean, you have no idea what's going on. But then finally, when you develop uh, a comfort level and you can finally look out the window, that's when you can experience the joy of flight. And do either of the other two of you fly? Well, I think uh, one of the things that's interesting about flight, it's much like automobiles. Um, you know, the earlier automobiles, it was, you know, a, a very sensory experience. You're dealing with the elements and so forth. And now we're just completely isolated in our cars and we have no touch with uh, the road because of the uh, sophistication of the suspension and the braking and so forth. And uh, my most exciting flying experience was uh, a number of years ago, I got to fly a 1916 um, Sopwith one and a half strutter, a, a, a World War One open cockpit biplane with a rotary engine. And uh, it, it really was kind of a, a you're so you're so much um, in response to the environment. And of course, as, uh, uh, as our colleague here was just pointing out that uh, now we're same sort of thing, you're so isolated. So I think um, um, what's what's lost from flying, uh, unless perhaps you're, you know, in a sophisticated military jet or something like that, which I have no experience with, um, is you've lost that sort of sensory experience. And um, uh, I'll kind of just add another Wright Brothers story. Um, uh, it was referenced earlier, the crash that uh, killed uh, Thomas Selfridge in 1908 in the Wright military flyer. Well, Orville was very severely injured in that crash and he had back problems and other issues for the rest of his life. He made his last flight as a pilot in 1918. He lived until 1948 and in, from 1918 to 1948, he only flew a handful of times again because the vibration of the airplanes in that era was painful for him. So it was a great irony that one of the inventors of the airplane flying was a painful and pleasant experience for him. Uh, so if only, um, he were allowed to fly today and able to fly today, perhaps he could enjoy flying again. Uh, but I think the, the, the thing about flight through this period is that um, we've moved from uh, being very much um, in touch with the environment and, and uh, all of the, those elements that um, you encounter in these early airplanes uh, to one where we become quite removed from the original flying experience. I'll just add that uh, following on Peter's comment, I think that uh, flying, flying today pain. in the uh, post-COVID, post-9-11 era is a painful experience, unfortunately. Um, having said that, I've, <laughs> I've enjoyed uh, flying experiences ranging from balloons and particularly sailplanes all the way through high-performance jet aircraft. And uh, I would echo what Leo says. It's quite remarkable if your backseat in an aircraft or for that matter, if you're in a commercial aircraft, it's quite remarkable simply to think about what you're doing and what you're experiencing. You have a vista that uh, did not exist over a century and a quarter ago. Uh, and you are seeing the, you're seeing the advances in rate of maneuver you know if we take a look at mobility rates we enter the 19th century at about six miles an hour uh, the speed of an animal drawn vehicle we enter the 20th century at 60 miles an hour the speed of a steam locomotive we enter the 21st century at 600 miles an hour the speed of an intercontinental jet airliner and actually if you extend that we're on track right now, if you take a look at hypersonics, to enter the next century at about 6,000 miles an hour. The question is, will it be us? Thank you. I am working on my hot air balloon rating right now, so I'm back in contact with the environment. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yes, and I'll just say that I was, and I had in my mind William Butler Yeats's poem, An Irish Airman Foresees yes. His Death, which That's has right. this wonderful, you know, a lonely impulse of delight so drove to those this that I find I do not cloud. hate. <laughs> no. That's right. That's in my wallet. I carry that 
that hmm. line in my wallet. Oh, lovely. I am going to ask, if I may, might I have each of you speak for a final minute or so, some concluding words on the subject, and then I'll wrap up. Um, I, I think the same order as we started out with. Um, Dr. Jacob, may I ask if you would go first? Uh, sure. Since I'm the, the Wright Brothers person, I'll, I'll finish up with a Wright Brothers story. Um, uh, as I said, Orville Wright lived until 1948, so he witnessed uh, the development of aviation up through the Second World War. And um, during the Second World War, um, he was asked, did he have any regrets about inventing the airplane, given all the death and destruction wrought from the air during the Second World War? And his response was quite interesting. He said, well, I uh, liken the invention of the airplane to the development of fire. Fire, of course, can be a very destructive thing, but it was also uh, critical to the development of civilization. And uh, uh, Dick uh, mentioned uh, the kind of the founding father of the history of technology, Mel Kranzberg, uh, uh, earlier. And Kranzberg, among other things, um, had a principle uh, uh, where he said that technology is neither positive nor negative, but nor is it neutral. There's always consequences. There's always complexity. Um, we can look at, you know, the, the internet today. There's an incredibly wonderful things that the internet allows us to do, but there's also a very dark side to the internet and what, what its consequences are. So I thought um, Orville's um, sort of assessment of the invention of the airplane was um, quite a thoughtful one where um, he's, you know, he essentially said, well, it's, it's neither positive nor negative, but nor is it neutral. From my perspective, uh, I think what strikes me is what the rights let loose upon the world, which I think was uh, on balance, a very positive invention. Uh, to, put it in, to put it in human terms, my father was born in May, 1903, uh, which of course is before the Wright's flight. And he died uh, in 1982, by which time he had lived through the aviation revolution and lived to the point where we had routine return of astronauts from space aboard the space shuttle. Uh, those were things that would have simply been incomprehensible to a person in the 1903 uh, timeframe looking ahead. You know, if you think about the rights in 1908, uh, had they been pulled into the president's office and asked, what do you think is the future of this invention of yours? And they had said, well, you know, with perfect foresight, well, you know, if we make an investment of billions, perhaps even trillions of dollars, and we lay concrete all around the globe, and we develop technologies we don't even have now, for example, something we'll call radar, and a propulsion system we'll call the gas turbine, and we make all these other developments, we might get to the point with a, a whole new industrial base where we're flying 600 million people through American skies by the turn of the century. They would have been thought to be absolutely mad, and yet that's exactly what happened. So with the technologies, the technology of flight, I think, teaches us that looking today at the technologies we're dealing with today, we have no idea where these will ultimately wind up, but we should take heart from what we've seen with the aviation revolution, that these other revolutions that are in place now will be of no less uh, consequence and significance. I found uh, one author who used three words to describe the Wright's achievements. And that was the death of impossibility. Before the Wright brothers flew, human flight was held as the standard of impossibility. But after the Wright brothers flew, it seemed like everybody could seem to do it. Thank you. All right, sorry, thank you all so much. Thank you, our distinguished panelists. Thank you, our audience. We do it for you. We can't do it without you. Uh, delighted uh, to have both the speakers to speak and the audience to make this you know, a, a real event. Now, I'm going to just close with a little bit of the housekeeping business again. One, if you have questions, again, please send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org. I'll be delighted to forward your questions to our speakers so they can have the option to respond to you. Also, Again, within 24 hours, this recording should be up uh, and available on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. That's for everyone, for panelists, for friends, for audience, um, all your nearest and dearest. 
I would also like to then advertise. If you like this, consider becoming a member of the National Association of Scholars. Go to our website, look for the donate, not donate button, the join button. Excuse me, the donate also works. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we'd be delighted to have you as a member. We do this. We do many other webinars. We do all sorts of things. So I'll just put that up, uh, thought out there for you. I want to mention upcoming webinars. Within the American Innovation Series, our next one is going to be Rocket to the Stars, that's on December 15th, followed by Satellites, Sputnik to the International Space Station, and that'll be on January 10th, uh, 2023. I will also mention we are still doing our American Literature Webinar Series, and that's going to be, gosh, I may be missing one, but at the very least, uh, there's one coming up on November 29th on the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell, Dashiell Hammett. That should be a lot of fun. Uh, so we have a variety of webinars on that, you know, on, on our research reports, on everything. So mentioning all that to everyone, come back to us. Come and take a look. Um, I think that's it for the business. So again, I guess just finally, uh, thank you. Thank you all again. So wonderful. <laughs>